Welcome to this commanded feast day of the Lord, the last day of unleavened bread. This is a day of rejoicing. And the title for the sermon today is Rejoice in Deliverance. Rejoice in Deliverance. We rejoice this day in remembering Israel's deliverance from slavery in ancient Egypt and what that account shows us about God. We rejoice in remembering our deliverance from sin made possible through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and our repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands to receive His Spirit. We rejoice in our deliverance from ignorance of God's plan to greater understanding, especially that God wants us to be his true sons and daughters. We rejoice in deliverance from impediments to God's plan, and we rejoice that our entry to the kingdom of God is near. So what happened this day in history? What biblical doctrine is associated with this day? What do we learn, if anything, from this past week? And how should we move forward towards God's kingdom? Let's start with some history. Let's go back to Exodus 13. Exodus 13. I'll start in verse 5. Exodus 13 and verse 5. Moses was saying that it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you. So this is something that God said he swore to give the land to the Israelites, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So we've been eating unleavened bread for seven days. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. That's today. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. So this seventh day is a feast to the Lord. And we should just remember in passing that Jesus and his whole family, they kept these feast days every year. You can read about that in Luke 2, verse 41. So we're imitating Jesus Christ. We're following what he did and what the word of God says to do to keep this feast day. Let's go on to verse 8. Verse 8. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up out of Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your, your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you up out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. So we have eaten unleavened bread for seven days, that the Lord's law may be within our mouth. We should talk about it. And we should understand that the Lord's law is very important. It's the truth of God. And love is very important. God wants us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul. Of course, the heart is a symbol for emotions. We need to have emotion in our worship for God. With our mind, our intellect, we understand certain things. And with our soul, our, our physical strength. So we can understand that we should be and people. Love the Lord in truth and love. We need the intellect. We need the emotion. We need both. We can't have one or the other. Because if you have just one, like just all law, just all or the truth of God, then you're sort of lacking the emotion, the kindness, the care. But you could be also on the other side as well, just all emotion, all love. And, well, I don't have to obey anything because Jesus did everything for me. But I've been reading the Bible this week and just noticing how it just seems like really every time God wanted to heal someone, wanted them to, to receive a blessing, they had to do something. They had to walk they had to wash at the certain pool of Siloam. They had to do something. So we are truth and love people. We're and people. So let's go on now to verse 20, Exodus 13 and verse 20. So they took their journey from Sukkot and camped in Etam at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them, to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, was this actually prophesied in a way? Yes, you can hold your place there in Exodus 13, but go back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, where was the promise that God had made to the fathers? In Genesis 15, and I won't be reading all of this. This is a really great study, but we'll start in verse 7. And God said to him, I am the Lord. 
who brought you out of Ur the Chaldees, to give you this land to inherit it. So he made a promise. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he didn't cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And just in passing, I can tell you this was a prophecy of Jesus Christ dying as the sun was going down in the afternoon. Horror and great darkness fell upon him. The horror of the Son of God being beaten, crucified, and great darkness on the land from 12 to 3 o'clock. And he said to Abram, No, certainly, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And will serve them, they will afflict them 400 years. Prophecy about the slavery in Egypt. And all that time they were under Egyptian political control. Also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down, so it was a new day. It was dark. Behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces, confirming the covenant. But a smoking oven and a burning torch, interesting. On that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the land, river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So this was where God made the covenant to give the land. And we see also the smoke, and we see the torch. God led them by the way. And it's just interesting, if you just turn over now to Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 5, Isaiah chapter 4 verse 5, we see this same sign will be once again given in the millennium. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 5. Isaiah 4 verse 5, again this is a prophecy of the future. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment, by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place on Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering. So this shows the presence of God, the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was with the people of Israel as they came out of Egypt pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day, and Jesus Christ will be in Jerusalem, that same sign in the world tomorrow. So we see how these things tie together. So God led them, back into Exodus now, God led them out of Egypt, and they came out on that night to be much remembered, the night they came out. But it wasn't just all just wonderful. They, they weren't in the promised land yet. We see in Exodus 14, verse 4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so he will pursue them. I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. So God, he wanted the Egyptians to learn something too. So the Israelites, they left, but the devil was pursuing them. Pharaoh was pursuing them. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lift up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They were upset. What, what's going on? They were confident at first, but then now they were afraid. The confidence of the peoples melt. And they blame Moses for this. I wonder, did anybody try to go back to the Egyptians and surrender? Hey, you know, let's make a deal. It was all a big mistake. <laughs> what would have happened to them if they had turned around and tried to do that? What will happen to us if we turn around and try to make a deal with the world today? Verse 13, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Oh, that really helps a lot, you know. <laughs> but, you know, we, he, he gives a solution. So you just can't say, oh, don't be afraid, don't feel that way. They were afraid. They had reason to be afraid. The, the Egyptian army was there. Moses said, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So that was the solution. God would fight for them. Hold your peace. And Lord, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. I'm sure everybody's going, right, but uh, Moses, uh, you know, the, 
the sea is in the way. We're, we're here uh, on this place, the, the Egyptians are there, and the sea is there. What, what do we do? Well, but of course we know it's no problem for our God. So they went forward. They went forward because, verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. So what we understand from history, from tradition as well, is that this is the last night was that night when the wind came all night, made the sea into dry land. The waters were divided. The children of Israel, they get up early, and boy, they did they rush. They rushed through the Red Sea in the midst of the sea. The waters were a wall on them on their right hand, on their left. The Egyptians pursued. Now, it wasn't that insane. I mean, they, they just gone through all those, uh, those plagues in Egypt. It was totally insane. But they pursued them anyway into the midst of the sea, Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. So we see that again. He troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels. And that must have been funny. You know, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the wheels off. Pop! And so then the Egyptians said, Oh my, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I mean, was it only when the chariot wheels fell off that they realized, we got a problem? Well, no. They all died. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters may come back upon the Egyptians. Verse 27, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. When the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots, horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were walled them on the right hand and on the left. So Israel saved. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. So this is that day. This is what we understand by tradition, that this is the day that Israel walked through the sea, the Egyptian army was destroyed. We can rejoice because this account shows that God keeps his promises. We might not think so, we might not understand, but he keeps his promises. We can rejoice because this account shows that God hears the prayers of his people and acts to save them from powers and situations greater than what people can handle. We can rejoice because this account shows that God wants his people to live free from idolatry and ignorance and the pain that sin brings. They were in slavery to Egypt. Egypt is a type of sin. And they were in pain. Their children were being killed. The boys being thrown into the river. God wants us to live free. He wanted Israel to live free. And they were delivered by a type of baptism. Israel was surrounded by water and the cloud overhead, so it's, it's like a type of baptism. And Israel rejoiced in deliverance from Egypt that day. There's a whole song that they gave in Exodus 15. We rejoice in deliverance from the penalty of sin and slavery to sin after we are baptized. But as Israel had rejoiced, they weren't in the promised land just yet. Neither are we. What is the theme or one of the doctrines that's associated with this day? It is the doctrine of baptisms. So let's talk about that. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, the manna that came down from heaven. All drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They drank the water that God produced miraculously. A spiritual food, that spiritual drink that came spiritually was water, but it came miraculously from the rock. It's just interesting. Israel ate the physical matzo and the water, and Jesus, which was Jesus, they sustained them with life. We eat the spiritual bread, Jesus Christ, and we also eat or drink the wine, Jesus Christ, his blood, figuratively speaking, and gives us life. 
And I just find it interesting that the very first miracle that Jesus performed was changing water into wine. So maybe there's a connection there. But in fact, water baptism for the nation of Israel happened this day. Now, by itself, baptism doesn't bring a change in our lifestyle. It just doesn't. Another baptism is needed for lasting change. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. I remember when I was young, I was baptized, and I really was physically totally immersed in water in, in a mainstream church. And, um, but I didn't know what sin was, so I didn't change my lifestyle. I mean, I was sincere. I wanted to do the right thing. But baptism, being immersed in water by itself, doesn't change us per se. Something else is needed for lasting change. In Matthew 3 and verse 11, this is the account of John the Baptist. And I'll, well, I'll start in verse 7. John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And don't think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, Abraham is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. For God is able to, able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. How many baptisms does the Bible talk about? Three. Three. Baptism of water to repentance. And again, repentance is God's gift. And this baptism is an outward ritual, I guess you could say, of what God has done or is doing inwardly. It gives us repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And so we are plunged down into the water, and that pictures death. And our sins are washed away in that watery grave. But then there's a second one. There's water, and then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Now start in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So we see a spirit baptism puts us into the church of God. One body with many members. Many members. And it's by the laying on of hands that we receive God's spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So we see here the spirit allows us to communicate intimately with God and understand the spiritual intent of God's law. Carnal man cannot understand the things of God without his spirit. And so we understand that we are baptized and our sins are forgiven. And then hands are laid on us so we might receive the Holy Spirit. That, and it's God that the Spirit plunges us into his body. And so we gain understanding. And what understanding we gain, one of the understandings we gain is in 2 Corinthians 6. Because God comes to live in us. We in him, him in us. He lives in us through the Spirit. And we become the temple of the living God personally, and then collectively as the church of God. 2 Corinthians 6, 
2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Idolatry. For you are the temple of the living God. Yes, individually, God lives in us, in each one of us. And he lives in the church of God as a whole. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So we rejoice that the baptism of the Spirit has delivered us from the ignorance of God's plan and purpose, has connected us to God as his sons and daughters. Now, there is that third baptism, and that's the baptism of fire. So let's go back very quickly to 2 Peter chapter 3. And this is an indication that the wicked will be burnt up. Those who refuse to repent, refuse to repent and, and put away their sins, they will not live forever. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. And that heat will burn up the wicked. Just very briefly, we'll go back to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Chapter 1. Malachi 4, 1, that behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. They won't be able to come back in any way, shape, or form. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. And you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. The wicked will be burnt up. Those not changed into spirit beings will die, will die. So we see Noah and his family. They were saved from the wickedness of that world through a baptism in the flood. Israel was saved from the wickedness of Egypt by the baptism in the Red Sea. And we are also being saved from the wickedness of this world by baptism and the receipt of God's Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. So, again, why are we here today? We've already seen in Exodus 13 that it's a commanded assembly. And I will just also add one more. Leviticus 23, it's well known. In this one chapter, all of God's holy days, all of God's appointed times are mentioned. Leviticus 23 and verse 8. It says, But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You should do no customary work on it. So we are here at the command of God. We follow the example of Jesus Christ and his family who kept all these days. And, of course, we follow the command of even in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, where it says that, therefore, let us keep the feast. So the Apostle Paul reiterated that command. So we are definitely following the command and the example of Jesus Christ and the apostles. So let's talk a little bit more about history. I love history, so we'll talk a bit more about it. And we can rejoice in deliverance from impediments to God's plan. Josephus, who is an ancient historian, uh, he wrote An Antiquities of the Jews, book 5, chapter 1, paragraph 5. He said, on the first day of unleavened bread, Israel began the siege of Jericho. They crossed the Jordan River, and it's just interesting, by crossing the Jordan River, perhaps that was a type of baptism for Israel as they, before they entered into the land. And they had to have circumcision. And they had, had a few days to sort of recover from that operation. And then it came to the time to begin the siege of Jericho, because Jericho guarded the entrance to the Promised Land. 
And they couldn't just sort of bypass it because it would have cut off their lines, their communication, so they had to take the city of Jericho. The Jameson Fawcett Brown Commentary says that Jericho fell on the last day of unleavened bread, on a weekly Sabbath. It's interesting. So, from what we understand by the commentaries and the indications in the book of Joshua, it seems like that they began the siege of Jericho on a Sunday, which was the first day of unleavened bread that year. And then they did the siege and did what they did, and then the walls fell down on a weekly Sabbath, the last day of unleavened bread on a weekly Sabbath. Let's go back to Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. So again, this day apparently reminds us, it should remind us, of the fall of Jericho. Joshua chapter 5. I'll start in verse 13. Well, no, let's go back. I'll start in verse 8. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people, they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate the produce of the land on the day after the Passover. So from what we understand, the Passover was a weekly Sabbath. And so the very next day was the first day of unleavened bread. On the day after the Passover, uh, they ate the produce of the land on the day after the Passover. Unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Now they couldn't eat the produce of the land until they had done the wave omer offering. And the wave omer offering was done on the Sabbath day, or the Sunday, the first day of the week. So that was the Sunday. They ate unleavened bread, and they also uh, ate parched grain the same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. So on the Monday, the manna stopped. Verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, and again, this possibly was a few days before all this happened. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Just interesting you think about that. Men without God's help cannot recognize God. Who was this commander of the armies of the Lord? It was the one who became Jesus Christ. The one who became Jesus Christ was there. This was a time, and apparently the only time that I can remember and can find where Jesus actually was there as commander of the armies. Now, spiritually, he was always there with them from time to time, but here he manifested himself and Joshua fell down at his feet. It's interesting, Day of Atonement, same situation. How can you tell which goat is for Azazel, which goat is for the Lord? Well, God has to tell us. So Jesus, uh, Jesus takes personal command of the army. And then, starting in chapter 6, verse 1, Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king, the mighty men of valor, and this is the plan. Now think about it as we read it. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. The seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh thing you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall grow up every man straight before him. So I can just imagine Jesus with a smile on his face saying, Joshua, I've got a plan. It's going to rock their world. And then he explains the plan. And Joshua's going, what? What? What do you think? You know, what do we think, Joshua? And Joshua's going, wow, that's an amazing plan. You want, you want, you want us to walk around once? For six days, and then on the seventh day, walk around seven times. You don't want us to build siege walls. You don't want us to have 
you know, ramps or ladders. And after we walked around seven times, and everyone's really tired because it probably took about an hour to walk, walk around the city. Sorry about that. <laughs> they got really tired. And then he wants to shout, and then we go take the city, right? Yeah, yeah. What a plan. You think, eh, what kind of plan is that? But Joshua, you know, he said, okay, you're the commander, you're God, we'll do it. And I can imagine that Jesus could have smiled at him and said, you know, Joshua, it's just a reminder, whose strength is it that's going to bring down those walls? Not your strength, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, these things will happen. God does want us to remember whose strength is it. It's not ours. But just think about it. They walked around seven times that last day, seven hours probably, and they shouted, and the walls came down. So several lessons. God directs us to fulfill his purpose in ways we don't understand. So we need to trust him. As I said already, another lesson, not by our might or power, but by his spirit, we will overcome. And so we see in Joshua 6, in verse 15, it came to pass on the seventh day, and again, according to the commentaries and the history, apparently that was today. They came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day. They marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So it says the city was doomed to destruction. Only Rahab the harlot shall live and all those who are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So there was a warning. Don't take anything, burn it all. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So verse 20, the people shouted, when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the pe people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. And there is archaeological evidence that that's what happened. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox, sheep, and donkey, with the edge of the sword. But they did save Rahab and her family. And then getting ahead of the story, but Rahab married one of the spies, apparently, and she was the mother, it seems, of Boaz, and she became one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ because of her faith, her trust. But it's interesting, God brought the walls down, but Israel still had to go in and take the city. We have our part to do in the plan of God. God will not do everything for us, in spite of what many people in the religious world say today. So Israel was now free to begin entering the Promised Land after the fall of Jericho. But sin is still there, and sin still has to be found and put out. Joshua 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. I'll just summarize the story. They sent a, an expedition up to the village of Ai, and they didn't take it. They were defeated before Ai. And, and everybody said, well, what's happening? I thought God was going to be with us. Everyone's all upset. Joshua tears his clothes, and God says to Joshua, verse 10, Get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. So they had to figure out who did this. God said, neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. So they went through the process of finding which tribe, which clan, which family. And it came down to Achan. Verse 18, he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, make confession to him. Tell me now, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Achan said to Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 
200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them. I took them, and then they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver underneath it. So he sent messengers, and yep, that's where they all were. And you know, all his family died because the family had to know that these things were buried in the middle of the tent. So they all shared in the cover-up. They all shared in the cover-up. What are some of the lessons here? We have our part to do in the plan of God. God will not do it all for us. But sin hurts others as well as the sinner. A group could be having big problems and not know that the reason why is hidden sin in their ranks. Another lesson. There can be no compromise with this world's sins. If one sins in secret, be sure your sin will find you out. Eventually, it all comes out. And it's another interesting point. The Bible is tied together in many interesting ways. What did Achan do? He took the evil garment, he took the gold, and he died. So he lost the sight of his eyes. Let's go back to Mark 10. Mark 10, verse 46. Mark 10, verse 46. We have the account of Jesus passing through Jericho. Mark 10, 46. They came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Many warned him to be quiet, but he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. He said, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. You see how this ties up that loose end of Akan. Akan took the Babylonian garment, and we know that garments are like a symbol of righteousness, righteous acts, and he died. He lost the sight of his eyes. Bartimaeus, he had lost the sight of his eyes, and he had a garment, but he threw that garment away, symbolically throwing away the Babylonian garment, and by his faith in Jesus, he believed God, whereas Achan didn't believe God. Bartimaeus believed God, and his sight was restored. There are many such scripture pairs that tie the Bible together. It's very interesting. So what did we learn this week, if anything? Did any leavening surprise you? Did uh, something unexpected happen that led to sin? Did we find leavening? where we did not expect it to be. Um, I would be interested in hearing your stories. We have a very nice neighbor, and um, they, uh, they want to give us stuff all the time. And so it was during the week. Uh, you know, Rhonda had made some really yummy, unleavened uh, thumbprint cookies and brownies and things, so forth like this. So we'd given some to our neighbors. So they thought, oh, well, they would give something to us. So they baked a really yummy looking baked good what was it it was some a strudel so they brought it to us for free <laughs> what do you do what do you do well we had to make choices and of course we got rid of it nicely politely and without hurting their feelings sin is all around us brethren it's offered to us free and we have to make choices so we have to identify sin. In other words, come to know the right. Then we have to isolate that sin, choose the right, and then eliminate the sin. Do the right. Know the right, choose the right, do the right. Identify it, put it away, repent of it. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for sin. Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know, I suspect that tree was made, uh, was a tree that grew croissants. Um, and every year we have a feast to remind us of the wrong choice they made. Now you might ask, really? A tree that grows croissants? Well, yes, croissants have a flaky, crisp crust, nice golden brown, but lots of air below. 
they look good, they taste good. You know, croissant people can have a superficial righteousness and no spiritual strength below. So our spirituality, superficial, knowledge only. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. Obviously, I'm making, uh, hopefully, a humorous comparison about, you know, of course, we know probably it wasn't croissants because they weren't invented that time, but we don't know what kind of fruit it was, but I like croissants. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. That's why I said before, we need knowledge of what God's plan and purpose and the law of God, but we must also have love, love that gives us strength, the care, the concern for others. We are and people, knowledge and love, truth and love. So, what did we learn this week? And we also have to keep putting sin out. Sin always tries to come in, tries to sneak in. It's everywhere. It's like yeast spores are everywhere in this world. Wherever you know, the, the atmosphere is, yeast spores are hovering around. Yeast and sin are everywhere. Sin, the devil, broadcast. He's the, the prince of the power of the air. So we always have to be on guard because it, it can come upon us unexpected, unwanted, free, and can get us into a lot of trouble. And we have to also remember, even though we have knowledge Please, we must have love. Love edifies. So, truth and love. So, how did Jesus resist sin? He had to go through a whole corrupt society. He had to go for years and years and years. Let's go back to Hebrews 5. How can we resist the sin that's so clearly around us as we go forward from these days of unleavened bread? Tomorrow, you could eat leavening. And beyond, because leavening is only a symbol for sin for seven days during the year. But like I said, sin is always there. And we have to identify it, isolate it, and put it away. Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus Christ prayed often. He had godly fear. He learned the price of obedience. He saw sin all around, but he kept the goal before him. He knew the importance of his mission. And I think we should all reflect on the importance of our mission as well. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. It's all around. It's there to just snare us when we were not paying attention. Let us run with endurance, with patience, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was that joy set before him? The joy of knowing and expecting brothers and sisters to become fully born as spirit-born sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. This whole universe, they planned it out, Jesus Christ created all things under God the Father so that he is, is one his one sacrifice to pay the penalty for all sins. The joy, the joy of having brothers and sisters, great relationships forever. He kept that before him. So we need to keep our big goal in mind of having eternal life, serving God, loving God, loving our neighbor. We need to have courage and trials, as we heard in the sermonette. We're not going to escape trials. We have to learn how to manage them. Be strong. Could Jesus have sinned? If the answer is no, then why did he resist unto bloodshed, striving against sin? I believe he could have sinned, but he chose consistently not to sin. He was a fighter and an overcomer. 
He was not a quitter. There is no glory in a victimhood mentality. Brethren, this day marks the day that Israel escaped Egyptian political control when by walking through the Red Sea of Baptism they escaped and Pharaoh's army was destroyed. We can rejoice because this account shows that God keeps his promises. We can rejoice because this account gives us strong evidence that God hears the prayers of his people and he acts to save them from powers and situations greater than what people can handle. We can rejoice because this account shows that God wants his people to live free from idolatry and ignorance and the pain that sin brings. This day is associated with the doctrine of baptisms. Let us rejoice in our deliverance from the penalty of sin through repentance, faith, baptism, and the laying on of hands to receive God's Spirit. Let us rejoice that God has given us a portion of His Holy Spirit that allows us to understand the plan of God, be part of His church, and to participate in building godly character so that we can become His true Spirit-born sons and daughters. This day reminds us of the day Jericho fell, allowing Israel entry into the Promised Land. Let us rejoice that God will act in ways we cannot foresee or even understand to deliver us from problems greater than we can handle. We learned this week that sin is everywhere, easily available. Let us rejoice that God teaches us to identify sin, isolate sin in our words and deeds, and eliminate sin with God's help. We learned that to overcome as Jesus did, we need to be serious in our prayers, keep our eyes on the bigger goal while we actively do the work of God and wait for Him to fulfill promises. Let us rejoice that God will never, ever leave us or forsake us. As we go forward from this feast, let us press towards the soon coming kingdom of God with faith, confidence, and courage. He will lead us into the promised land, the kingdom of God, and we will live happily ever after for all eternity.